Thank you, Men's Course, and Dr. Toller for the introduction. It's always nice to be presented by someone whose paycheck you sign. It kind of makes a difference in the uh, quality of the introduction, and I'm thankful for that. Our society is infatuated with anniversaries, I guess. Birthday parties have become a kind of staple of life, and as Willard Scott reminds us daily, older birthdays are very special. So it's no surprise that in keeping with our annual tradition, the Southwestern family is gathered on this Founders Day 1993 to celebrate the seminary's 85th birthday. We give thanks to God for this venerable institution and a center of theological learning, and it is a center of learning. Uh, Neil Harris of the University of Chicago says, the reason schools like ours here become centers of knowledge, full of knowledge, is that new students bring knowledge in and graduates don't take any out, so the knowledge accumulates here. <clears throat> and uh, we want to thank you on this octogenarian anniversary for your contribution to this uh, pool of knowledge that keeps the seminary in the forefront. We don't know exactly uh, when the seminary began celebrating Founders Day. <clears throat> On the first and second birthdays of the seminary, 1909 and 10, there's no record of any Founders Day celebration. They did have their first commencement, and I noted with interest that the commencement speakers on that occasion, two of them, were J. Frank Norris and George W. Truett. Kind of an interesting combination. On the third anniversary in 1911, <clears throat> the concerns were focused on financing the new Fort Worth Hall, and they skipped the Founders Day that day, that year. Uh, Dr. Carroll, in raising money for the first building, wrote, among others, Reverend Frank Groner, First Baptist Church, Stanford, Texas, and he said, Dear brother, I'm up a tree. Can you and your fine men at the church help me? Whereupon Brother Groner replied, I'm in a hole. How can a man in a hole help a man up a tree? <clears throat> and Dr. Carroll fired back a letter, When you come up the tree to help me, you'll be out of your hole. And, uh, <laughs> They were looking for money. In 1912 and 13, for the fourth and fifth birthdays of the seminary, there was so much to celebrate that the seminary apparently had no interest in Founders Day. Fort Worth Hall was completed, and the transportation into the city of Fort Worth was greatly improved. Up until then, the only way into town was to walk over what was often rain-soaked prairie, and Mrs. Jeff D. Ray called it black waxy mud, or else ride a temporary streetcar on inferior tracks to what is now the steel mill over here on Hemp Hill Drive in order to connect with the city line. Ms. Ray said the students named that uh, streetcar the Dinky because they said it reminded them of a lot of people who were all noise and rattle but no dependability. And she said it was a common saying that the dinky never ran when you wanted to ride and was constitutionally completely at rest on weekend days when it might have served some welcome purpose. But a little later, a more permanent streetcar line was extended and the campus celebrated this new transportational link to the city. It was only, it was, it was only until 1914 that the seminary celebrated its first Founders Day, as far as our records show, the sixth birthday, and the younger president of B.H. Carroll, J.M. Carroll, brought the Founders Day address. From that date up until about 1953, every Founders Day topic seemed to have centered on some aspect of the life and work of B.H. Carroll, the founder, leading to the conclusion that the original purpose for this day was, was to recognize the founder, uh, Dr. B.H. Carroll. Since 53, the topics have varied and covered a wide range of reflections on Southwestern's heritage. My topic for this 85th birthday is a narrative inquiry, finding Southwestern's uniqueness in stories. One of the continuing and most elusive challenges of these past 15 years has been the attempt to define Southwestern's uniqueness. What characteristics set this seminary apart from all others? Exactly what is the spirit of Southwestern? It's a little like the word time. Every one of us knows what time is until we're asked to define it. And we all know what the spirit of Southwestern is until we're asked to define it. What distinguishes Southwestern as unique? Well, perhaps the best way to answer that question is not to analyze the seminary's uniqueness directly, but simply to tell her stories again. This kind of narrative approach would be in step with contemporary hermeneutical methods such as narrative criticism. 
Narrative theologians say they approach the Bible in such a way as to liberate the simple stories in Scripture from the oppression of conceptual and theoretical types of analysis. Narratology, the word they use, they say, is so fundamental to human experience as to be the basic form of our human expression, unavoidable because our lives are so caught up in the temporal and historical shape of existence. Even the church, Stanley Howard says, is a story-formed community whose stories not only give us identity, but they inform our character. Stories more than rule books shape how we behave and live. And William Bausch says, a person without a story is a person with amnesia. A country without a story has ceased to exist, and a humanity without a story has lost its soul. But every storyteller, William Court warns, must beware of wanting to expand on the story, analyzing its morals and encumbering it with points or meanings. It's better, he says, to let the story simply speak for itself, allow the points to arise naturally from the story as it unfolds. Cosentacus underscores that advice when he told about St. Francis' response to a novice who wanted a theological book on the resurrection of Jesus. Francis said, listen, my child, each year at Easter, when they retell the story of the risen Christ, it seems we can see Christ's resurrection. It is as though all the faithful had gathered at his tomb and were weeping inconsolably, beating on the ground to make it open. And behold, in the midst of all our lamentations, it seems the tombstone crumbles in places and Christ springs from the earth and ascends to heaven, smiling at us with a white banner waving. We see the resurrection. He said, there was only one year I didn't see him resurrected. That year, a theologian of consequence, a graduate of the University of Bologna, came to us. He mounted the pulpit in church, and he began to elucidate the resurrection for hours on end. He explained and explained until our heads began to swim, and that year, the tombstone did not crumble, and I swear to you, no one saw the resurrection. It's the story that counts. Robert McAfee Brown says, hearing another story can often force us to tell our story in a different way. We're transformed to such a degree that we can properly call the experience one of conversion. Either we must become participants in the other story or else we must disengage fully from it. Nathan's story of the ewe lamb had a moral so explicit that David was drawn into the story to the point of taking sides and expressing sympathy for the underdog. And then it became David's story when Nathan declared, you are the man. And this is what Paul Ricoeur refers to as the hermeneutical circle. The reader comes full circle. First, he says, there is the initial fascination with the story and then a more critical hearing of the story until we come to the post-critical moment when our own story kicks in and we participate in the narrative ourselves. In like manner, when we hear the Southwestern story, we're drawn into it at points and our own story, each of our stories, is woven into the fabric of that total narrative. So as we search for Southwestern's uniqueness, as we explore our institutional hermeneutic, let's review our own stories again, too, and remember where we were grafted in to this larger narrative. Southwestern's uniqueness can first be found in stories of spiritual beginnings. In a faculty retreat a few years ago, Professor Robert Baker, whom we miss so much, related part of what we might call our charter story. He said one of the factors that shaped Southwestern's distinctiveness was the fact that its founder, B.H. Carroll, knew what it meant to be lost. He accounted how this 22-year-old giant returned from the Civil War to his home in Caldwell, Texas, wounded, never got over that wound. Despondent, he came home to find his young wife had been unfaithful, their marriage annulled. He had nowhere to turn for comfort. During all his life, he had denied the truth of the Christian revelation. His brother said that whenever a chaplain would preach to the soldiers in the army, young, brilliant B.H. Carroll would promptly mount a stump and rebut brilliantly everything the chaplain had said. In Carroll's great sermon called My Infidelity, he said, I had turned my back on Christianity and had found nothing in infidelity. Happiness was gone, but death wouldn't come. The Civil War had left me a wounded cripple on crutches, utterly poverty-stricken, loaded with debt. 
But the internal war of infidelity left me bound like Prometheus on the cold rock while vultures tore with beak and talons, a, a life that would suffer but would not die. Carol knew the brokenness, the alienation, the abandonment, the, whole, the loneliness, the spiritual emptiness that lostness brings. He, he knew what it meant to be lost. But Dr. Baker said he also knew what it meant to be saved. He attended another of those frequent revival meetings, which had before that time brought only more doubts and anger to Carol. Preachers and friends had long tried to reason with him and pray with him, beg him, and without avail. But at the close of this particular service, Dr. Baker said, Although he had been unmoved by the sermon, he waited at the rear of the tent while the choir practiced for the next service. Their voices singing the hymn, O land of rest, for thee I sigh, when will the moment come when I shall lay my armor by and dwell in peace at home? And in a holistic experience that included not only his head, but his will, his brokenness, and his heart, B.H. Carroll was captured by God in appalling experience of conversion. He was saved. Carol slipped back home to his bed and knelt there weeping without saying a word to anyone, but his mother found him kneeling there by the bed praying and touching his shoulder tenderly. She said, Harvey, you've been saved. And they enjoy, embraced and rejoiced. And all of his ministry, this man never once doubted the power of the gospel. He had experienced the transformation that only a divine intervention could accomplish, and he knew what it meant not only to be lost but to be saved. And that kind of spiritual certainty gave form and substance to the foundation of this institution. No wonder Carol's deathbed experience has been so important in defining the spirit of this school. After many days in a coma, the venerable man of God died November 11, 1914, and his last words to L.R. Scarborough, who followed him, were, Lee, keep the seminary lashed to the cross. Southwestern's uniqueness is unalterably bound to these spiritual beginnings. But secondly, Southwestern's uniqueness can be found in stories of its providential survival against overwhelming odds. Dr. Lee R. Scarborough became president of Southwestern in 1915. His life covered an amazing span of, of historical change. He had never seen an automobile until he was grown. But before he died, the Enola Gray delivered the first atomic bomb on Japan. Receiving the mantle of leadership from Southwestern's great founder, he shepherded this school through difficult days of struggle and opposition, not the least of which were those rugged days when this barren site called Seminary Hill was being developed. I want you to listen to this story, W.W. W. Barnes' description of the campus, when as a new teacher, he brought his wife here to Fort Worth in the early summer of 1913. I had hoped that Seminary Hill might be fresh and green for her first sight of it. There had been a little rain in June. Other than that, there had been no rain in Fort Worth for two years. The campus, he said, was a cross-section of a Johnson grass farm. <laughs> for one building at the northwest corner, Fort Worth Hall, driveways had been marked off in curves by the plow and the grading machine. But that had already all grown up in Johnson grass again, and people drove across in wagons and buggies and a few automobiles in whichever direction they chose. There were no trees, no shrubbery of any sort on the campus. Around the campus on one side, trees had been planted when the seminary first came three years earlier, but only about three trees at the entrance were living. <laughs> the whole campus presented a most bedraggled and despondent appearance. And incidentally, I don't think it looked much better when I first saw it in 1948. It hadn't changed much. <laughs> Unfortunately, con conditions got worse before they got much better. The country entered the debilitating depression of 1925-1933, and the very existence of Southwestern was threatened. Income dropped, debt accumulated, investments earned disappointing yields, desperate attempts at earnings sent seminary employees to the Rio Grande Valley to cultivate a citrus grove given to the seminary. Let me tell you the story of what really hard times are. In May of 1930, the administration had to cut faculty salaries by 10%. Teachers of voice and instrument were given no salary and asked instead to charge the students directly for music lessons for their own compensation. Eventually, no salaries at all could be paid. 
And for many months and even years, faculty accepted fruit from the Rio Grande Valley Orchard and gifts of food from local churches to exist. It all came to a head in the SBC Executive Committee meeting in Nashville, September 1930. Dismal financial reports given by all the convention agencies. Listen to Gain Dobbin's story. Report after report of the convention's boards and agencies indicated practical bankruptcy. At length, Dr. L. R. Scarborough, president of Southwestern Seminary, arose and choking with emotion said, in effect, brethren, we're through at Southwestern. For two years, we haven't paid faculty salaries. We have nothing with which to meet expenses. Our percentage of the allocation will not see us through another year. Here's my resignation. I turn over to you the seminary property. You'll have to sell it to pay our debts and Southwestern will go out of existence. There was stunned silence. We sat in tears. Then Dr. Sampy, the president of Southern Seminary arose, drummed with his fingers on the table in characteristic fashion. He said in effect, I may lose my job for what I'm about to say, but Southern Seminary has some income from endowment on which we can live. I move that Southern Seminary's apportionment of the budget be cut and the difference given to Southwestern. Southern Seminary gave its money to help Southwestern keep going. It's about that point where my own story begins to bridge into Southwestern's. It seemed to me ironic in looking at this material that the very month, September, 1930, a thousand miles from Nashville, where Dr. Scarborough was giving his shocking report, in the middle of a swirling panhandle dust storm in the front bedroom of my grandparents' house on Virginia Street in Amarillo, Texas, your president was born. Thought you'd be interested in that. <clears throat> Perhaps far worse than the stories of economic struggle are the horror stories of the assault on Southwestern by the popular pastor of Fort Worth's First Baptist Church. At first, Reverend J. Frank Norris praised and supported the seminary with a kind of overbearing compliment during the seminary's move to Fort Worth. Norris said such things as, not since Peter preached on Pentecost and baptized 3,000 converts, has there been anything more glorious than the founding, endowing, and locating of the Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary on the banks of the Trinity River. But his praise soon shifted to scorn. Norris's church mysteriously burned. He was indicted, later acquitted for arson. His life was threatened. There were attempts to burn his parsonage. Norris even shot a man who threatened him in the church office. He dismissed church committees. He banned the WMU in his church. He took over complete autocratic control of the congregation's life and began a lifelong tirade against all Baptist denominational activity. As a result, many of the numerous seminary professors and students and staff who had been members of First Baptist Church began to move their letters to other congregations and quickly a spirit of alienation grew up between Norris and this school. When his financial secretary joined College Avenue Baptist Church, Norris rebuked the pastor of that church in his First Baptist Church paper publicly, calling him, quote, long, lean, lank, yellow, suck-egging dog. Lovely man, lovely man. Makes, uh, makes some of our recent denominational rhetoric look kind of pale and anemic, doesn't it, beside that? Little wonder that the Tarrant pa Baptist Pastors Conference ex expelled Norris from their membership. Then listen to the story of another young man who was a member of First Baptist Church when he was called to preach. His name was C.E. Matthews. He later became pastor of Travis Avenue Baptist Church here in Fort Worth. While Norris was away, the church ordained young Matthews and he entered Southwestern Seminary. But when Norris returned and learned he had entered the seminary, he forced the church to rescind his ordination and refused to grant him or his family a church letter. As President Scarborough desperately fought to keep the seminary afloat during the Depression, Norris would brag on the prosperity of his own church and taunt Scarborough as the president of what he called a bankrupt school. Knowing that the faculty was not even being paid the 50% to which their salaries had been cut, Norris sarcastically sent fruit baskets to each professor with his compliments. Too bad, he said, that, quote, poor Truett and poor Scarborough could not provide for them. Lovely man. I will always remember the story Mrs. Evelyn Lineberry told me a few years ago while we sat around a campfire drinking chuck wagon coffee, literally from 10 cups on her frying pan ranch just west of Midland. Her father was William Scarborough, President Lee Scarborough's brother. 
a typical West Texas rancher who wore a six gun on his hip. They called him Wild Bill Scarborough. What a combination. The chair of fire, Lee Scarborough here, Wild Bill Scarborough out on the ranch in West Texas. Mrs. Lineberry said she remembered how her uncle Lee frequently came to Midland to borrow money from his cowboy brother to pay the salaries of the professors. One day, she told me, when her dad read in the Star Telegram how Frank Norris was abusing Dr. Scarborough in the seminary, my daddy buckled on his six gun, took the train to Fort Worth, <laughs> barged into Norris's study, and putting his hand on the revolver, said slowly and simply, you better leave my little brother Lee alone. <laughs> And then he stalked out of the church. <laughs> when I got back to Fort Worth from the frying pan ranch that day, I called my brother Don, who was always twice my size, and I, I told him I wanted to enlist him for a new responsibility for seminary <laughs> president's brothers. We, uh, we had paradigm shifts back in those days too, you know, as we do today. It was at the trustee meeting on May 14, 1942, that L.R. Scarborough presented his resignation, exhausted after 34 years of service to the seminary. He said, I can't tell you how great a wrench to my soul it's been and is to separate myself from this noble band. When the vital bloodstream of one's soul flows into a great institution with its struggles and triumphs, it's no small task to turn the currents of that bloodstream in another direction. At his request, the trustees voted that President Scarborough and his wife might live near the seminary's orchards in the Rio Grande Valley and without salary, supervise their daily operations. He died three years later, April 10, 1945, having led Southwestern to survive some of its darkest days. And now as we hear these stories of God's providence in dark days, we take hope for the future, having found another clue to Southwestern's uniqueness. Third, Southwestern's uniqueness can be found in stories of biblical balance. What's the uniqueness of Southwestern? A lot of people have answered that by giving balancing paradoxes. Southwestern is professional and yet pastoral. It is scholarly and yet practical. It is experiential but not theoretical. It is conservative but not anti-intellectual. It is large but not inhuman. Dr. Baker in his great history book pointed out that Southwestern's faculty never conceived of the seminary as a one-sided academic ivory tower in which to retire from the world for study. But they saw it as a frontline bunker where students participated in contemporary spiritual battles. The weekly memorization of many scripture verses in the evangelism classes of Dr. Scarborough was not just an academic exercise. It was loading the students' weapons for regular use and winning people to Christ after the example of their teacher. The lectures of W.T. Connor became apologetic or polemical grist for a student's mill. The sermon outlines submitted in homiletics class were used in church and mission services in the following week. Sunday school principles enunciated by J.M. Price were practiced almost before the ink on the students' notes had dried. And music students made preparation for weekly services through their daily classes in music. There was a balance between theory and practice. Listen to Perry Crouch's story. Many of the times I left a class in evangelism taught by Dr. Scarborough or New Testament by Dr. Dana or Course in Atonement taught by Dr. Connor, wishing it were Saturday so I could go to my student church and preach the good news of the gospel of Christ I had heard. There were no compromises taught here, no substitutes, no uncertainties. We were taught that there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Herschel Hobbes illustrates that characteristic balance between the academic and ministerial practice in his story. He said one summer Dr. Scarber preached a revival in a rural church out from Mineral Wells during that time, he tried to win a lost man to Christ, but with no visible results. But the following winter, about 11 in the evening, he received a call from that man. He was under deep conviction. And he asked Dr. Scarborough if he would come immediately to his house in Weatherford to speak to him. The roads were covered with snow and ice, as they may be today, on a bitterly cold night. Without a moment's hesitation, Scarborough said that he would be there as soon as he could drive to the home, over 50 miles away, part of it over country roads. And when he arrived about 2.30 a.m., he found the man up and waiting for him. And in a short time, the man received Christ as his Savior. Then the man said, 
I suppose you wondered why I would ask you to make this long drive at night in this weather over such roads. And Dr. Scarborough said, yes, as a matter of fact, I have. And then the man said, well, when you talked to me last summer, I wondered if you really cared about me and if what you were telling me was real. If you had told me you would come when the weather was warmer and the roads were clear, you could as well have forgotten the whole thing. But when you came tonight, I knew you really cared about me and that your words to me were real. That balance between scholarship and spiritual service was dramatically portrayed again when missions professor Baker James Cawthon responded to his own appeal for missions commitment, mission volunteers, resigned his class, his faculty position, and in 1939, at the beginning of World War II, went to China himself as a Southern Baptist missionary. These stories of biblical balance between the theoretical and the practical, the academic and the spiritual, help us define the uniqueness of Southwestern. And then last, Southwestern spirit can also be defined in stories of our common humanity here. Humorous stories that in their own way help to shape our institutional hermeneutic. In his last years, B.H. Carroll was given a medication that sedated him. And his family said he would murmur aloud sometimes as he lay only half awake. One day, Miss Carroll listened to him as he prayed in that half awake condition. She heard him say, oh Lord, you know that I don't mind dying. I'm ready to go, but I worry so much about Hallie and my family. What will they do after I'm gone? I hate to go and leave them in this wicked world. So, Lord, I pray that you'll take Hallie and my family before I go so that I can go in peace. <laughs> well, knowing how often God had answered her husband's prayers in days gone by, Mrs. Carroll was understandably upset, and she quickly changed his medication and uh, made it a little more possible for him to pray. Believe it or not, today's professors are not the first of Southwestern's faculty with reputations of giving impossible exams and tough tests. Listen to the story of church history professor W.W. W. Barnes, whose classroom tests were notorious. One exam day, he was writing the questions on the chalkboard. The class sat in stunned silence as he put the period at the end of the last question on the board. And about that time, the students heard a phone ring in the office across the hall. Immediately, Virginia Smith, the manager of the bookstore who had answered the phone, stuck her head in the classroom door and asked, is Paul Aiken in here? And one of the shell-shocked students looking at the test questions on the board answered, sister, everybody's Aiken in here. <laughs> I think even in these humorous stories from Southwestern's past, we learn something about her spirit and the uniqueness of this school. And now the conclusion. At some point, this dramatic Southwestern story becomes your story and mine too. Where, where does your story intertwine with this dramatic narrative? As I indicated earlier, I was born in 1930 when the seminary was barely surviving. I was saved and baptized in 1939, the year Jess Northcutt began teaching here, and ironically, the same year that Southwestern began its Department of Philosophy of Religion, which would be my major field of PhD studies 21 years later. I led my first soul to Christ during a revival in 1940 walking down the aisle of First Baptist Church, Port Arthur, with a nine-year-old friend of mine who wanted to be saved like I was. When I shook evangelist George Truitt's hand and told him about my friend, I had no inkling that he was serving as the chairman of trustees of the world's greatest seminary, where God would lead me someday to as a student and an adjunct teacher and later as president. Unknown to me, too, in 1940, at about the same time, Betty, my wife went to Palacios Baptist Encampment with her Houston church group and under the glass on my desk here in the office is a picture of my wife at the age of nine standing with George Truitt, who was the preacher that year at Palacios, never dreaming that the great man was then serving as chairman of the board here. It's so fascinating to look back at the intersections of our own personal story with the narrative of the seminary. A year and a half after Dr. Scarborough's death in September 1946, a young, handsome, systematic theology professor named W. Boyd Hunt, who's here today, 
resigned to accept the pastorate of the First Baptist Church, Houston. He was there long enough to minister to my wife's Betty's family following the death of her father and then in 1952 performed the wedding ceremony for Betty and Russell Dilday on a hot, unair conditioned August evening in 1952 in Houston. Five months later, Dr. Hunt came back to Southwestern to rejoin the faculty and became our teacher. When Leo Garrett and Ralph Smith, Curtis Vaughn, Hubert Drumright, John Newport began teaching here those brief years of beginnings, I was trying to juggle academic assignments at Baylor University with a heavy dating schedule, which um, included trying to get Betty Doyne back to the girls' dorm by 8.15 p.m., the curfew then. Can you believe that? <laughs> it was on that campus that God's call was made clear to me, and I made plans to enter Southwestern. Then when Betty and I married and moved into the brand new, notice, brand new Carroll Park Apartments in 1952, <laughs> it seemed providential that Betty's former pastor, Dr. E.D. Head, who had baptized her in First Baptist Church Houston, would be in his last year as president of Southwestern. We remember how shocked we were that Dr. and Mrs. Carroll humbly accepted our brash invitation and had dinner with us in our little seminary apartment. Six months later, March 1953, he resigned. I don't know if there's any connection to that at all. Years later, April 1983, I was told that Dr. Head, not knowing, of course, who Southwestern's president would be at the time, had included in his will the stipulation that the president would preach the funeral for his handicapped son, Douglas, whom we'd come to know. I became the one to perform that graveside memorial service at Laurel Land, completing the narrative circle, interweaving our story with his. Same is true of J. Howard Williams, my dad's relationship there in the Baptist General Convention of Texas. And then that story is picked up again in the chain of Southwesterns during Dr. Naylor's presidency when he invited me to bring the commencement address here at Southwestern in July 1975 after many years of not having been back on this campus very frequently. Later that same year, the faculty invited me to speak at their annual retreat. I renewed friendships with professors I had respected so highly as a student. Two years later, back on campus for the pastor's conference and speaking in chapel during that week. And during that week, an unusual event took place that I have not repeated very often. One afternoon, Professor Leon Marsh, now retired in Alabama, called me into his office in Price Hall and shut the door. He said, Dr. Dilday, I had a mysterious dream last night. I dreamed I made an appointment to see President Naylor about some matter, and on the day of the appointment, I knocked on his office door. In the dream, he said, come in, and when I walked in the room and looked at his desk, you were sitting in his chair. And in Dr. Marsh's characteristic forthright manner, he said, young man, kneel right here, and we're going to pray. And I did, and I... Uh, <laughs> He said, I believe you're going to be the next president of the seminary. And he led in a remarkable prayer. And I left that office stunned and perplexed and, and in all honesty, a little bit leery of an eccentric professor that I, <laughs> I got to know and appreciate a lot better in years uh, to come. But then in the final link of that providential chain of events, I was also asked to preach the seminary revival in the fall of 77. By then, the search committee had moved in a more serious way in our relationship. Rumors were circulating. I began to feel very awkward about being here on campus for the revival and what that would mean to the possibility of real renewal. On the other hand, I didn't want to appear presumptuous to back out as though I'd already been elected. But after prayer, I spoke to Dr. Naylor, suggesting it might be best for me not to be there. I suggested Dr. Fletcher, my good friend, as a substitute. Dr. Naylor agreed. Dr. Fletcher accepted and led what became one of Southwestern's outstanding revival weeks. And on November the 22nd of that year, I was elected president, and the ever-blending story continues. How has the Southwestern story affected you? When and where did your story begin to merge with this institutional narrative? I hope you've gotten caught up in the story and have opened the doors where your connection began to enter. And you've helped to answer the question, what is the uniqueness of this school? Dr. Scarber had an answer. At his inauguration, he defined Southwestern's uniqueness as threefold. It is denominationally anchored as a distinctively Baptist institution. Secondly, its teachings are based on the Word of God. Unitarianism and destructive biblical criticism, he said, with their denunciations of the supernatural in Christianity, cannot receive even a faint smile of approval in any corner of the seminary's theology. And third, 
It magnifies both scholarship and spiritual life along with practical efficiency in church and kingdom service. Our aim, he said, is to meet the needs of a suffering world in high places and low with adaptable, efficient, evangelistic, spirit-filled ministers. That's the Southwestern spirit. And then here, bundling all these stories together, Robert Baker pulling from them this fourfold description of Southwestern's uniqueness. The seminary is unique in that it's been forced to learn how to live by faith. Providence has given this school unforgettable lessons that it belongs to God and can only go forward in faith in God. Second, he says it's unique because students and faculty share the same experiences. Poverty, sacrifice, dedication, a common calling. Their teaching is not theoretical. They're a part of that to which they call other students to participate. Third, he said the seminary is distinctive in its concept of the nature of theological ed education, not an academic ivory tower, but a front-lying bunker of balance. And then fourth, the se seminary is built upon spiritual sensitivity, evangelism, missions, and the local New Testament church. That's the Southwestern spirit. Bernard of Clairvaux expressed it in this final word. He said there are many who seek knowledge for the sake of knowledge. That's curiosity. There are others who desire to know in order that they themselves may be known, and that's vanity. But there are some who seek knowledge in order to serve and edify others, and that is love. Let me capture that last phrase. There are some who seek knowledge in order to serve and edify others, and that's Southwestern. Seeking knowledge in order to serve and edify others, that is the Southwestern spirit. Thank <clears throat> you.